name to you, they represent already coming. Smith has filed numerous pre-trial motions. The state has filed some pre-trial motions. And Mr. McBride's counsel has filed some pre-trial motions. Uh, I assume uh, one of the issues we need to address initially is the motion of the state to disqualify defense counsel. Uh, have you heard on that, Mr. Attorney General? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, the court believes that the state may ask that the court make available the witnesses on this motion, uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Clark. Uh, the purpose of that is to show that the same evidence is very intended to be used by me and the evidence to be shown to Mr. Johnson and Mr. Clark. We have consistently asked that these witnesses be given the witnesses on the motion, Your Honor. Okay. I'll defer my decision until this argument is complete and your argument is complete. And I'll make a determination for what I feel is necessary that those witnesses give live testimony on the motion. All right. Yes, sir. So, just for the record, there are quite a number of witnesses in the courtroom, and usually they both prove this time. Right. If there any, is anyone present here in the courtroom that has been served with witness subpoena, to testify today at the hearing, I would ask you if you would to uh, have a seat outside until the next time you're called to testify. Your Honor, I think James I asked about what excuse the witness is saying when I was on the hand and said I don't have a plan to say that. And that's fine. Yes, sir. About an hour. Rest on the premise that there 
exists a conflict of interest when an advocate is asked to be a witness. Now, Mr. Lay may want to explain the nature of his conversation with Mr. Smith. He may want to minimize the nature of his conversation with Mr. Smith. He may want to suggest that he's never had any direct conversations with Christopher Butler, who was to be the subject of the assistance that Mr. Wade was brought in to provide. But the point is, only Jim Wade can testify to the content of those conversations with Robert Smith. Obviously, the state's not at liberty to put Mr. Smith, the defendant, on the stand and to ask him about those conversations. And the tapes, as your honor, has, if you had a chance to review those, you know, they plainly demonstrate that Robert Schuler Smith had a conversation with Jim Wade about assisting him in obtaining injunctive or declaratory relief toward the end of getting the charges against Christopher Butler dismissed. All right, counsel, I'm going to play devil's advocate with you for a moment. From having reviewed those tapes, a strong argument can be made that Mr. Smith is attempting to try to figure out some way to gain standing to file in the federal court some civil action uh, against the Attorney General's office for lack of a description of who he's concerned about, but to attempt to obtain an injunction to stop uh, the Attorney General from putting, I guess you would say, pressure on Mr. Butler. Do you not anticipate that, that Mr. Wade is called as a witness when you start questioning him about the substance of that conversation? He's going to claim attorney-client privilege and will be successful in that claim and not have to testify about the advice that he gave Mr. Smith? So I don't think it relates to whether he's a material witness or not. Your Honor, if, if he was counsel to Mr. Smith, that's, that's the first time we've heard that he was representing Mr. Smith. He's never suggested, and we've never been told, that he was acting as counsel for Robert Smith. He was brought in to assist. There's comment in the tape about Mr. S Mr. Uh, Butler joining in with an effort for an injunctive relief. Does that not indicate that the conversation between Mr. Smith and Mr. Wade may have been for legal advice? from Mr. Wade to Mr. Smith about a civil action in federal court on behalf of Mr. Smith. Well, if, if it does, Your Honor, and if the, if the allegation is going to be he acted on advice of counsel, then again, Mr. Wade is rendered a witness because we're entitled to know what disclosures were made to Mr. Wade by Mr. Smith in seeking legal advice, if that is the position that he takes, that he was seeking legal advice from Jim Wade. Any advice of counsel defense, the state is entitled to inquire into what disclosures were made, what was told to Mr. Wade. And part of what was done was that Mr. McBride reviewed a videotape in two different cases here that were involved. The, the criminal case that the district attorney's office had initiated, part of the object of that declaratory injunctive relief appears to have been Judge Will to try to compel him to dismiss the case. And our position is, Your Honor, whatever advice, whatever role Mr. Wade was playing, we're entitled to put him on the witness stand and inquire of him about that, about the background that led up to his being brought in. And all of that renders him a witness and an advocate in this case. Let me ask you something else also. The Constitution obviously trumps any ethical standard. How do you respond to their argument that Mr. Smith is entitled to legal representation here and the corollary attorney of his choice, Mr. Wade? How, how does that argument, constitutional argument, how is it affected, if any, by the ethical rule? Well, because if I do what you want and disqualify Mr. Wade, I'm denying Mr. Smith the choice of the attorney that he wants to defend him in this criminal proceeding where you're trying to put Mr. Smith in a penitentiary. I think Your Honor has to look at all of the potential consequences. If the court 
believes Mr. Wade in this case, Mr. Wade is allowed to participate and to be a witness, and Mr. Smith is then convicted. I think Mr. Smith certainly would raise an argument that his lawyer should have been disqualified. They should have not have been allowed to continue in that dual role of advocate and witness in this case. So I think in the totality of the potential outcomes here, frankly, wisdom favors disqualification, I believe, in this case. There, there is certainly a right to counsel of choice, but the counsel has to be qualified and conflict-free in order to participate in the case. Who asked this? Who would you expect that would have standing to complain about that? Mr. Smith or the state? The state certainly has the right to, to argue. That's why we're here on this motion to disqualify. Well, the prophylactic reason for the ethical rule is to protect the client, correct? To protect the client and to ensure... It should be used as a shield, not as a sword, is it not? Right, and to ensure that the administration of justice is protected. In all respects. Anything else? Your opponent's side, and I'll give you an argument. That, 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 that's our motion. All right, thank you. Mr. Wade. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. 
Smith, as your honor has noted, said in his own words, these words, we got Jim Wade. And if you go back to the, uh, if you go back to the preceding conversation, what it's about, they made it very clear that they were discussing and seeking uh, input on the issue of, can Mr. Smith file a declaratory judgment against the Attorney General, essentially in federal court? That's the issue. And they made it very clear that that's discussed. If it is an illegal act, and that's one point I, you know, I want to raise as a matter of law, we believe it is not an illegal act for Mr. Smith either to discuss with me uh, uh, filing a declaratory judgment in federal court against the Attorney General or to get counsel from Mr. Smith. I mean, I'm sorry, from Mr. Butler. They, they claim Mr. Butler already had counsel, and uh, that's one of the purposes of our witnesses to show that he did not, but I don't think it's material. Regardless, he has a view under numerous cases to protect the rights of the accused, including the right of the accused to be free from excessive labor. These states allude to the fact that Mr. Butler is in jail on a $500,000 bond on a, a, apparently a relatively small offense, a non-violent offense, and there's a compelling argument that his rights to excessive bail under the United States Constitution are being violated. Well, counsel, I hate to digress, but as I understand it, Mr. Butler is out on two felony indictments for possession of a large quantity of marijuana. Right. Under the Constitution, if there's probable cause for a third felony, he's supposed to be his bond revoked on his first two charges and placed back in jail if that is the circumstance. So even whether he's bondable or not on the third charge of wire fraud to me is well, going to get any traction, I guess. I mean, I don't want to disagree with the court about that, but taking the correctness of your argument, if Mr. Smith, as a district attorney, in his discretion, believes Mr. Butler is being retaliated against, for example, his cell phone offense. You know, I, I practice law in these prisons calling on cell phones all the time. If the real reason Mr. Butler is being held under this bond is to retaliate against him for making these charges of drug or bad or for making these charges he's been threatened, then to me, for you, I mean, it's his discretion as a prosecutor if he wants to look into that and subpoena witnesses to that. That's his decision. To be wrong, if your honor says, well, you're wrong, Mr. Butler was supposed to be in jail, that, that's an executive decision of, of the attorney general and how he, you know, how he goes about his office. Assuming that Mr. Butler was not in doubt of bail and he's all along with that, that still doesn't make Mr. Smith guilty of a criminal offense because he, he alleges that his constitutional rights are being violated. Your Honor, the things the counsel said, we could follow and stipulate the things that he said because we're right in the paper. You know, the, the points that he wants to make. I, I, I want to look also, Your Honor, at the, at the rules. The rules make a distinction, especially the comments. If Your Honor would look at the comments to the professional rule 3.7, it prohibits, Your Honor, to look under the code of comparison and it goes on to compare when the when an opposing party, when a district attorney wants to call me as a witness, as to when I want to call myself. If you're going to look under code of comments, disciplinary rule 105A. If disciplinary rule 105A has right. one of the two main prohibits a lawyer or a lawyer firm from serving as an advocate that the lawyer learns or it is obvious that he or the lawyer ought to be called as a witness. Now this will apply if I decide or if Mr. Smith decides he wants to call me as a witness, then I would be disqualified. That's what that indicates. On the other hand, this is where Rule 501B provides that a lawyer and the lawyer's firm may continue representation if the lawyer learns or is obvious that he or the lawyer and his firm may be called as a witness other than on behalf of his client. In other words, if he wants to call me, that doesn't afford him this disqualifying. Unless it's apparent that my testimony will harm Mr. Smith. Unless it becomes apparent that my testimony will harm him. Uh, Your Honor, I think really at the heart of this, is it illegal? Is that an illegal act for Mr. Smith to try to get the lawyer either to file a declaratory judgment or to get a lawyer from Mr. Butler? Is that an illegal act? We suggest that it's not. But in any event, assuming that it is, if he wants to call me as a lawyer, as a witness, that doesn't disqualify me under this rule. The disqualification would come about if I saw Mr. Smith saw to call me as a lawyer. Your, Your Honor, there are, uh, there are several Mississippi cases, uh, and I, did, I failed to bring them all, but one of them was at 641 Southern 715, where it was actually held a personal error today, where a defendant called, did call his lawyer a witness. It's an impeachment witness to what the state said, and Mississippi Supreme Court ruled a personal error not to align to it. Regardless of what the 
rule of ethics said, although that would certainly violate this rule of ethics we just discussed, the Mississippi Supreme Court said that the defendant has an overriding right to put on witnesses on his own behalf, whether or not that violates the rule of ethics is not a concern of the court in deciding the admissibility of evidence. Mr. Wade, I have a question. Yes. I assume from your argument you are prepared, if necessary, in the future to respond to some complaint that may be filed against you by your client for violating the canons of professional rules of professional conduct. Yes. You are correct? Absolutely. Okay. Your Honor, I might point out, Attorney General is not asking to file one of the ethics complaints. They file one against Robert because he received a criminal complaint. That's it. They have the right to go down there and file them, and I would expect they file one against me. But I don't believe I'm violating the rule of ethics because I'm not being, I'm not asking to come in and testify on behalf of Mr. Smith. They're saying they want to call me as a witness. So it's totally different. So I'm not violating the rule of ethics. But the overriding right, I'm trying not to say this, Your Honor. I started this case. We had a letter in the file. We haven't put on your testimony yet. In this case, the controversy between Mr. Smith on the one hand and the Attorney General of the FBI on the other hand has gone on a long time. This has been going on before this arrest warrant was ever issued. And Mr. Smith began talking to me about this, I believe, the first time in May before he was ever charged. So I'm almost uniquely qualified to know about the background of this. There are lots of things that seem, that may or may not become relevant. Lots of other cases that are relevant. And I've become familiar with all this. Are you arguing to me that changing horses in the middle of a race, so to speak, is going to be extraordinarily detrimental to your client because of your prior knowledge of all the controversies in this matter? Yes, because I've become familiar with all this. And I don't know what Your Honor's evidentiary ruling is going to be. For example, this transcript, Your Honor, will see a bunch of other people discuss other than Bob. And I don't know in advance how Your Honor's going to rule on the admissibility of this stuff. And I'll be familiar with it. And it would be very difficult and very expensive for another attorney to become familiar with it. I guess my primary argument is, Your Honor, that it violates the Constitution to deprive Mr. Smith of counsel of his choice. Second, it's determined by the rules of evidence, not by the rules of professional responsibility. And under the rules of evidence, I am not confident as a witness because Mr. Smith called me about legal advice. So I'm not a confident witness. What's your position about the Attorney General calling you as a witness about their right in the presence of the jury to have you take the witness stand, answer preliminary questions about who you are, et cetera, and then when they ask you specific questions about the substance of the phone conversation, you invoke privilege. Do you maintain that they cannot do that? From looking at these cases, Your Honor, frankly, I would think they would be allowed to. I think that goes into a question of their good faith because there's absolutely nothing they could get out of them that's not already in the tapes. What Smith has already said, there's nothing that I could possibly answer that's not already there. I understand. But I do think that they can do that if they choose to do it. That would be my opinion. All right. I want to hear from your client for just a moment. Mr. Smith, would you approach your podium, please, sir? I'm taking for granted you're a very intelligent lawyer, and so I'm not going to get into any depth. But you heard your lawyer's argument that he should not be disqualified from representing you. The Attorney General has announced their intention to call your lawyer as a witness. Do you understand all that? I do, yes, sir. I want to know from your own lips, do you waive any objection to your attorney continuing to represent you in this case? Yes, sir. I would like Mr. Wade to continue to represent me on this matter, and I can also explain that I reached out to Mr. Wade previous to the conversation, and if I may explain just a little bit. Yes, sir. Thank you. Your Honor, as the Court has pointed out very well, today's hearing was set for October 25th today for all motions to be heard. The Attorney General's office has been able to come into my office unannounced and arrest me on misdemeanor charges. Your Honor, I was just thinking, Mr. Smith, I'm going to ask you to come up here and talk to me. Thank you. Thank you.
that I'm interested solely in the issue of your attorney, Mr. Wade, continuing to represent you, the defendant in this criminal action, to conclusion in this case. That's all I'm really interested in. Yes, sir. I want to make sure you understand. I mean, yes, sir. let me hypothesize a circumstance that could develop. Maybe it won't. Hopefully it won't. Your attorney's called to the witness stand in the presence of the jury. He claims attorney-client privilege, refuses to testify. And in my judgment, assuming for the sake of this question, in my judgment, he should testify. And I order him to answer the question. And he refuses. I put him in the custody of the sheriff and let him sit in the hotel across the street until he changes his mind for contempt of court. You're left sitting over here without an attorney. And you're in the middle of your trial. That is a possibility that can develop. I don't want that to happen. But that's a possibility. Are you telling me now you're ready to run the risk of such an event occurring? And you want Mr. Wade to continue to represent you regardless of this potential conflict he has. Is that what you want? Yes, sir. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. All right. Response from the attorney general. Mr. Johnson. Just a couple of things. Mr. Wade wanted to point the court's attention to the code comments. But I would direct the court to look at the comment to Rule 3.7. And the first sentence says, Dividing the roles of advocate and witness can prejudice the opposing party and can involve conflict of interest between the lawyer and the client. The opposing party here being the state of Mississippi. And the next paragraph goes on to say, The opposing party has a proper objection where the combination of roles may prejudice that party's rights in the litigation. The witness is required to testify on the basis of personal knowledge while the advocate is expected to explain and comment on evidence given by others. It may not be clear whether a statement by an advocate witness should be taken as proof or as an analysis of the proof. Now, part of the analysis the court has to make here, as well as the potential conflict and the harm and the constitutional issues tied up with Mr. Smith's right to choose his counsel, is the prejudice to the state in putting on its case and not having access to all the witnesses we need in order to prove our case. And our position, as I've stated on this point, the later point, Your Honor, is that our case in chief will include calling Jim Wade as a witness. There's no way around it. There's no substitute for that. Nobody else was on the telephone when Rob Smith called and talked to him. Nobody else can attest to, describe, or testify to what conversations they had. And that's the basis for our motion. Thank you, sir. On all of these pretrial motions, I would expect the party who considers himself to be successful on the motion to be prepared to present to me later an order to sign and memorializing my ruling, if you will. On this particular matter, the court considered judgment that the motion to disqualify Mr. Wade as counsel was not well taken and should be denied. I'm concerned primarily with the constitutional right of the defendant to the assistance of competent counsel and the corollary of that is constitutional right to counsel of his choice. Good judgment to me is that the motion should be denied, so I'm going to deny it. I think next on the agenda probably should be the motions to quash that have been filed by both Mr. Smith and Mr. McBride because if I am inclined to grant those motions, most of these other motions become relatively moot. Mr. Wade, do you want to be heard on your motion to quash? Yes. Your Honor, let me point out that a portion of my motion only requires no further contention to argue that the statute is unconstitutional to me. There's another portion of my motion. As to count three? Yes, sir. Okay. There's another portion, well, as to count one and two, that does require further debate. You're talking about one and two? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Wade.
whether there are enough essential facts or alleged in count one and two to withstand a motion to quash. Your Honor, we would 
get into a long discussion about what was going on with Spain and them, this is probably not the appropriate time to do it. All I'm saying is that this is not this is not charged in the indictment. To me, how could you have notice of the charge? Uh, in order to render, to render to Mr. Wade, how do you respond to the DA's argument, excuse me, the Attorney General's argument? That your client is not charged with uh, rendering criminal assistance. Your client is charged with conspiracy. And in a conspiracy indictment, when two or more people agree to commit an unlawful act or to commit a lawful act by unlawful means, that's the definition of a conspiracy. And the argument of the Attorney General is we're not required in an indictment to list all the elements of the underlying crime that was being conspired to be committed. How do you respond to that? You know, the way I respond to it is, in a case, for example, this was a conspiracy to commit murder, you wouldn't have to allege that, you know, that in the house there were goods kept for the sale or was it supposed to burglary and breaking in with intent to commit assault? Yeah. Was it burglary breaking in with intent to commit larceny? Yeah. Uh, if if you agree they don't have to allege that in a conspiracy to commit burglary, how can you argue that they have to allege it in a conspiracy to commit the offense of uh, hindering prosecution? Yes. Because, Your Honor, we would be on notice that you know, if it were assault, we would know what they're talking about. In this case, we don't know what they mean by renders criminal assistance. They may mean just exactly what Your Honor said. If they had put in there paragraph D, they would have to elaborate on it by talking about what act by you know, subpoenaing two witnesses to the grand jury. And then there would be an argument about is that a defense, is that a criminal defense to subpoena witnesses to the grand jury. But, but uh, in the normal case, you know, if this was a normal straight crime, there would probably not be any problem with an indictment saying, they conspired to commit murder. I think they would not do it. But in this case, this rendering criminal assistance can only be done in certain specified ways. And those are not here. And the rendering criminal, they could have conspired to render criminal assistance, say, for example, by getting him a lawyer. The professional rules of, of uh, ethics for prosecutors provide that a district attorney has the duty to get an end to the thumb of the law. That could be what they mean by rendering criminal assistance. We just don't know what the what, and we don't know what the grand jury indicted for. But I can say a burglary case, an arson case, you know, you know exactly what they're talking about. But we don't know. We, we don't know in this case. And I understand that they're indicted all the time for this offense, and it's always alleged as what the specific act is. In fact, one of the controversies, to show you, I, I know a little bit about the background, when Mr. Smith indicted these uh, state auditors for Henry prosecution, he put in there the subsections that apply, he put it right in the indictment, so you know what they're talking about. So I, I just don't don't feel like the indictment alleges, you know what uh, what they're talking about. Your Honor, let me go with what I think is my main argument, which is on point three on the board of faith. If Your Honor turns over to the second page of my motion. And I, I have this Johnson case, Your Honor. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to show you on that case. Before Your Honor rules on it, I'd like to, to ask specifically that, that Your Honor, I'll give you the court that, that Your Honor look at that case. This was a, a debate that's gone on between Justice Scalia, who wrote a concurring opinion in the Skilling case, the United States Supreme Court in the Skilling case. I might start out with the Skilling case and then bring you up to date with the subsequent Johnson case. They're both very recent cases. The Skilling case was a prosecution in the United States for Skilling for honest services. It was, uh, they indicted a prominent executive for failing to render honest services to his company on the grounds that he had misstated the value of the stock. He got a whole bunch of the stock uh, overstated and uh, sold with a huge profit. And the United States Supreme Court said is that federal statute that prohibits a, a, uh, a makes an unlawful act to fail to render honest services to your employer, is that constitutional? Over Justice Scalia's uh, dissent, the majority said that it was constitutional for one reason.